Let's go to uh, Psalm 144. Psalm 144. Psalm 144. And let's read verses 9 through 15. Psalm 144, beginning at verse 9, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. We left off last time with verses 7 and 8. Send thine hand from above, rid me and deliver me out of, the, out of great waters from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. And the comments that the right hand of the wicked, as in your right hand man, uh, is Satan. The Antichrist will be Satan in human form. And also the right hands of the wicked and the unsaved will have his mark in them. We've mentioned that many times during the tribulation. Here in verse 11, the Lord puts a verse that can describe someone still in the tribulation. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Uh, well, in the rest of the passage, they're from verses 9 through 15, are verses that deal with the millennium. And very often God uh, inserts a verse which seems to be out of sequence. And I, the only reason I can surmise is that he, he's there, it's there to test the heart, to test the belief of the reader or the scholar. Do you know the word scholar does not mean uh, an educated expert? It means a student. Look at any dictionary or the Bible's reference to it. A scholar is a student. When you get a scholarship, it's money to help you study, to pay for your education. It does not mean some presumptuous expert who thinks he can correct and change the Bible. But a scholar is a student, so all of you are, are scholars of the Bible today. And, um, but he's there to see if someone's going to rightly divide the word of truth or not. Let me, let me have you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 65 Isaiah 65 and uh, let's read the first let's see I may have the wrong reference. Hold on a second here. All right, I, make, I take that back. Make that Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, forgive me. And let's read the first two verses there. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, go forward, if you will, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4.
And uh, let's begin with verse 16. Luke 4, beginning at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, period. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. There's a, you'll notice the difference between how Isaiah's text reads and how Christ read it in the synagogue. He left off the part, uh, And the day of vengeance of our God. He separated his first coming from his second coming by a mere comma, by a mere punctuation mark. He knew exactly where he intended to stop reading and gave the, the book back to the one in charge in the synagogue. And uh, as our example, Christ shows us that rightly dividing the word of truth and I think I mentioned it in my book, is sometimes, sometimes has to be as, as uh, precise as a surgeon's scalpel to know exactly where to cut and not to go any farther. And so God puts a verse like verse 11 in our text to test someone to see if he's going to try to rightly divide the word truth or say that verse 11 somehow uh, applies somewhere else. But let's go back to it. Once again, the new song, they're mentioned in verse 9, that's a repeat of Psalm 33, verse 3, and Psalm 40, verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth, and praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Well, there certainly will be a new song in the mouths and uh, praise among the people when Jesus Christ begins to reign. You and I can make great uh, devotional use of that verse, because he gives you something to sing about. That's the, modern, the wonderful thing about a Bible, a New Testament Bible Christianity, is it's a singing religion. It's a musical religion. And um, there's a hymn book that we sing out of. It's got close to 500 songs, uh, all written about the life of one man in history. There's nothing like, and then you can go through and find other hymn books after hymn book after hymn book after hymn book. Fanny Crosby wrote uh, five to 6,000 songs, most of which are lost, but many of them are still in our book. John Wesley, or Charles Wesley rather, wrote a couple of thousand, maybe two or 3,000 songs as well. And then you have more modern time uh, uh, writers, Bill and Gloria Gaither and Jimmy and Carol Owens, back in the 60s and 70s, they wrote a lot of great praise music. And, uh, so many other, John W. Peterson, the editor of that hymn book, wrote thousands of songs and musical cantatas and Easter and uh, Christmas time musical arrangements. And then, um, and then, uh, oh, what are their names that do the Patch the Pirate? Hamilton. Right, the Hamiltons, uh, husband and wife team. They've written a lot of great songs. Our kids have sung many of them. And I've even sung one of them as a, as a solo. And you could lay the credit of probably 25 to 30,000 songs about Jesus at the feet of six people. And there have been a lot more than six people writing songs about Jesus Christ over the centuries. And there's no phenomenon like that in Hinduism or in Islam or even in Judaism. Or certainly not in Buddhism or Catholicism. It's just no, nothing quite like that. It's a singing religion. When you're in love with somebody, you want to sing about them. Your heart is moved and you're stirred because you're filled with joy and with happiness mm -hmm. what they mean to you and how much uh, happiness they brought to you. And um, there were a lot of, I mean, 
songwriters have tried to capture that in various ways. You know, they sing. You know, they sing about the most. The basis of most popular music is a love song of some kind. Of course, rock music. That's just more degenerated uh, variations of it. But uh, country western music still has some of that element in it, where a guy is singing about the love of his life, either his wife and or she's singing about her husband, or, and so on. And uh, there was a guy, I forget who wrote the song, but it was popular in the 40s. Whenever I sleep, I never count sheep. I count all the charms about Linda, whoever Linda was. But, but, and, um, but the thing about the gospel of Christ and the new birth is it inspires a singing religion. And I have to give credit where credit's due. Our Pentecostal brethren, for what they may lack in the depth of Bible study, they more than make up for in writing some great songs, writing some great praise music. And um, many of them have, have survived over the decades, and uh, God bless them. Because, and, and I think sometimes uh, Christians whose Christian walk is so based on emotion and emotionalism, uh, God nevertheless is able to use that uh, to bring out some wonderful music that stirs the heart and instructs the mind and the soul along the way. But the thing about being saved is it's a singing religion. And so he says, and very appropriately, verse 9, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. Uh, I heard someone say that instrument of ten strings could be equated to ten fingers and clapping your hands. You know, I, I don't know if that's the right way to approach it or not. But uh, there may be some instrument that was common in David's time that had ten strings upon it, probably a lyre of some type. Um, and verse 10, let's read verse 10 again. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. David has been delivered from the sword of Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. We talked about that in church time. He's been delivered from the sword of King Saul, 1 Samuel 19. He was delivered from the sword of the Syrians, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and from the sword of the Philistines in 2 Samuel 21. In 2 Samuel 21, you read about a man named Elhanan, who slew the brother of Goliath, the staff of whose uh, spear was like a weaver's beam. And um, we read about all those battles, and David rescued out of all them. The salvation in this verse is not spiritual salvation in the, in the New Testament sense, but the preservation of the king's life in battle. And the phrase, David his servant, that goes far beyond just King David. And that's going to apply to God's servant, Jesus Christ himself, um, being delivered from Satan. Uh, let me have you go to a couple of verses, a couple of places rather. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. And let's begin reading there with verse 13. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. But there Christ is called uh, God's servant, <clears throat> and as, as a suffering servant, uh, he would be delivered from the power of Satan. Go, if you will, back to Job, the book before Psalms, Job 19. Job 19, and let's begin there with verse 25. Job 19, beginning at verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, 
Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. But ye should say, Why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the work of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. There God's giving warning that the the wicked will be judged by the one that they thought to afflict. And uh, also in that passage, Job uh, anticipates being resurrected. He says, although after my flesh worms destroy this body, worms being another nice word for maggots uh, eating the body, uh, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So this flesh is going to be restored, put back together once again. I work in a funeral home during the week, and once in a while, every great while, someone will ask, do you think there's a, a, a distinction between, or one is better than the other, being buried or being cremated? And I said, well, I used to worry about that, thinking that the natural state of things would be to take the body and dispose of it <laughs> as a body. But now it doesn't bother. It doesn't matter to me. God knows where every part of particle is, where every molecule is, and when he's ready to put it back together, he'll know how to do it. By the way, cremation is simply uh, hastening the decay process that will naturally occur in the cemetery anyway, so they're both going to the same condition, and so I, I don't worry about it. However, I have had questions come to my mind, and I haven't really formulated a good answer for it but it doesn't trouble me, and that is, what if, what if a Christian had been an organ donor during life, and the rapture takes place, is that person who's walking around with your kidney going to lose that kidney? Is the kidney going to disappear out of their body? And I... Uh, <laughs> And I suppose the answer would be no. God's not indicative like that. God will know how to put the body back together in a way that pleases him. Besides, uh, you won't need the, you won't need the uh, function of your internal organs then as you do now anyway. So, but once in a while some quirky question will come to my mind and that being one of them. But anyway... Uh, Psalm 17, 13 says, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. God told the serpent, Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here, you notice uh, Genesis chapter 6 says, um, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, uh, and they bore uh, children to them. The same became men of old men, uh, men which were of old men of renown. And uh, there's where the, the beginning of giants began to appear after that. When uh, unclean spirits or demons intermixed with earthly women. And after that, all kinds of mythologies began to arise in Hinduism and Greek mythology centuries after that about the gods coming to earth and mixing with mortals. And um, Achilles was a Roman god. He had one weak spot. That was his heel. All of this derived from the story of God's promise to the devil that one day this woman's seed is going to destroy, going to crush your head. And I'm sure the devil's looking forward to that event. But, uh, and all of those elements of the creation, we believe the true account is found in our Bible, and everything else is sort of a knockoff, a copycat, some corrupted variation of it that doesn't have any real textual authority to it, and nothing you could say was even plausible in uh, human history. But, be that as it is. Um, let's go back to, go to Psalm chapter 2, or rather Psalm 2. Psalm 2. 
So while Satan may have thought to gain a, a partial victory in having Jesus Christ crucified, Christ had the ultimate victory when he came back to life from the dead. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now that's what modern man wants. He says, I don't want to hear about the Bible. Don't tell me that the Bible says this or God says that or something can't be allowed. You're a narrow-minded bigot because you don't uh, accept our marriage or, you know, or two men. You don't accept our decision to do this, do that. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has sent unto me. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So God will have the last laugh. They say he who laughs last, laughs best, because he's shown himself superior to the other ones that opposed him. And um, <clears throat> let's read verses 12 through 15 again. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Notice the language throughout this section, that our sons, that our daughters, that our garners, a garner is like a, a grain silo or a some storage place where you keep the excess uh, fruits, the excess um, crops as you've harvested, that our sheep, our oxen, our streets, and then in verse, fe verse 15, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Now, anyone should be able to make some beautiful spiritual and devotional applications to the Christian from this passage. And yet the context is Israel. Every time you see that word our, O-U-R, in this section, that's a reference to Jews in the millennium who God has redeemed, God has rescued and saved from the man of sin. The Antichrist and his people are up there in verse 11, strange children. Uh, those who follow in verses 12 to 14, they've been delivered from him, uh, just as David, who, Christ in type, was delivered from him in verse 10. And uh, for the context of all this, turn back to Job 42. Keep your finger here, but go back to Job 42. The book of Job is probably the greatest single picture of the Great Tribulation in the entire Bible. What we call the Great Tribulation, the last half of that seven-year period, uh, is 42 months, and Job has 42 chapters in it. <clears throat> but uh, Job, notice Job's captivity is turned and reversed there in Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now compare that to our text. Our text in verse 12 says, Our sons and our daughters... Look at Job 42, verse 13. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And in our text, verse 13 talks about our sheep and our oxen. Job 42, verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, 
and a thousand she asses. And then verses 14 and 15, back in our text, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. There is happiness and uh, contentment by those in verses 14 and 15. Look at Job 42 and uh, verse 10, which we read, Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And verse 16, After this lived Job in 140 years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. Well, that's happiness and contentment by most people's standard. Let me ask you, who would, who would we say, who would we think is the greatest Christian to have ever lived in church history? Most of us would agree that it was the Apostle Paul. The problem with modern commentaries in limiting everything they read to some sort of an inspirational or devotional interpretation is something like this. Paul had no physical sons or daughters that he could boast of, as verse 15 talks, or, you know. Um, and yet his God was certainly the Lord, verse 15. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. The Lord was his God. Paul had no garners to put anything in. Mentioned there in verse 13. He had no possessions, let alone uh, 10,000 sheep, as verse 13 mentions. He had no streets to call his own, our streets, as verse 14 described it. Uh, he said, here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come, Hebrews 13, verse 14. <clears throat> and Paul was never in such a case, as verse 15 describes. And yet he told you and I to follow him. So you can't say that the only interpretation of every text has to be some sort of inspirational um, or a spiritual application. Sometimes you have to take it literally. It may not apply to the New Testament saint, as this case uh, is. This is a good case of. He told you and I to follow him. Verse 15, happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. He said, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. And 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, but um, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul fulfilled the qualifications there in verse 15, and yet he never got any of the things promised in verses 12 to 14. This is why rightly dividing the word of truth is such an important doctrine, to understand what you can take literally and what you cannot, what may be intended for someone else. And this is a good a case in point, Verses 12 down through verse 15 is a picture of the Jew in the millennium once the Messiah is here enforcing peace and they receive him who had resisted the Antichrist and escaped the man of sin during the tribulation, go into the kingdom now and uh, receive Christ as the Messiah and he rules the world in power and authority as it as should have always been run and the rest of the universe by association, by extension, rather. But happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. You might say that the Lord is your God, and the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, and you may not have wealth and abundance, you may not have be prosperous with physical things and material things, so, so rightly dividing the word of truth, understanding what parts you can take, what parts you cannot. You know, uh, I was talking, uh, Brother Walker just recently uh, had published a book called Rightly Dividing the Bible, all about the history and the basics of dispensationalism. 
and uh, he sent me a copy, and now I see it's listed on the internet uh, for sale. And he intends to make it a, a three-volume set, ultimately. So he's working on the second volume. And last summer, we were at a summer camp, and he came out to preach to our young people. And one morning, we're sitting around um, the breakfast table, and I was asking him, how do we reconcile certain things we, we understand that certain books of the, um, for example, let me back up a little bit. In the Old Testament, we can look at so much that was written and say, well, that literally applied to the Jew at that time, or the, or the King David at that, in that case, or it's going to apply to the Jew one day in the future. But for our sakes right now, we can glean from it some sort of inspirational benefit, some devotional instruction, and apply that to our walk with Christ right now. And, and I said, and likewise, beginning with the book of Hebrews, for the rest of the New Testament, those books, we believe, are aimed at the Jew in the tribulation, or someone in the tribulation, to obey literally and pay close attention to. Because, and I said, but how do we reconcile something like this? 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And I said, 1 John 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I said, how do we know that, that somebody who's left after the rapture, reading the, how, do we, how do we know that those verses, um, we use those texts to defend our eternal security, to defend the fact that we're sons of God right now by the new birth? Even if we don't see it yet, we use those verses, and yet those are within the books we say are tribulation books. And I said, how do we justify that? And he's, he had a very simple answer, and I had to agree with him. He said, the Bible tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. It doesn't tell us to rightly to simply divide the books of the Bible. And as the case I mentioned earlier, where the Lord Jesus separated his first coming from his second coming by something as minor as a punctuation mark in the book of Isaiah. That sometimes you take one verse, may, you may have to ignore the context of all the verses around it, that one verse will be applied to some other time in the future, perhaps. Uh, or sometimes it's simply a clause within a verse is applied to a certain time in history. It might not all apply to you right now, and so we go to those books and draw out of it devotional and instruction material for ourselves now, the same way we do to the Old Testament. But many other parts in there indicate that <laughs> salvation will be by good works and being faithful unto the end. Uh, particularly the book of Revelation goes into that quite a bit. So I said, well, I, that's, that's a sound answer. I hadn't really simplified it like that. He said, rightly dividing the word of truth is not just dividing the books of the Bible, this goes here and that goes there, because within that book, you may have different elements that apply to different different, different uh, times. And I said, well, that's good. 